Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for the first episode of Becoming Multiplanetary in 2021. This year, we have a lot of really interesting things planned for the show. And to start, we will be talking about The Expanse, a TV show, the protomolecule from The Expanse, and CRISPR, a genetic editing technology. But first, I am one of the co-hosts, Kage, and I'll also let uh, one of our other co-hosts introduce himself. Rich? Hi there, everyone. I'm Rich LB. Uh, Happy New Year to everybody from Becoming Multiplanetary. Happy New Year 2021. Oh, looking forward to a better year than last, that's for sure. And uh, to start off this year, we, boy, we do have an episode for you. This is going to be a good one. So as as uh, Kake said, it's going to be covering the expanse, the protomolecule, and a uh, look into CRISPR gene editing and uh, parallels between the two. So Kage, would you like to start off? Absolutely, thank you. So as a forewarning, we will be talking about the Expanse TV series, which may contain some spoilers, so just bear that in mind as we talk about uh, things in this episode. If you have not yet had the opportunity to enjoy this fantastic show, you really should definitely change that and uh, watch this just absolutely fantastic series. It, it really is amazing. So without further ado, what is The Expanse? It's an award-winning and critically acclaimed science fiction series based on the novel series of the same name from Daniel Abraham and Ty Frank under the pen name of James S.A. Corey. It started on the U.S. television channel Sci-Fi and was later acquired by Amazon Prime Video. Now in its fifth season, The Expanse tells the story of humanity in the 24th century when humans have become a multiplanetary species that now reside not only on Earth, but in space stations throughout the solar system, on Earth's moon, on Mars, throughout the asteroid belt, and on many other planetary bodies. What is most compelling about The Expanse is not just the storytelling, but the story that it tells and how it's told. It is one of the most scientifically accurate shows, considering, for example, the toll that space takes on human bodies and how it changes them, and even simpler things like flip maneuvers to face the main engines in the direction of travel in order to decelerate. That's something you don't often see in many science fiction series, but it is actually a very important thing to consider when talking about a uh, moment of inertia and uh, how to slow a moving vehicle, or a moving entity, rather, in space. But what's more the important story that The Expanse tells is how humans become multiplanetary and the implications that this carries, including oppression, racism and nationalism of a completely new variety, and war. And so with that, let's start talking about The Expanse. Uh, in particular, the first season of The Expanse, which covers the initial aspects of what has happened with humanity being multiplanetary, not just on Earth, but also in space stations, Moon, Mars, uh, asteroid belts. There are actually three um, separate main factions of the uh, of uh, societies uh, within the Expanse. You have uh, people that live on Earth or in low Earth orbit, people that, uh, and also on uh, the Moon, uh, people that live on Mars and actually how Mars has become an independent nation might not exactly be the right word, but uh, we'll, we'll use that, an independent nation. And also the asteroid belt, uh, a group uh, known as the OPA, which uh, if I remember correctly stands for uh, Outer Planetary Alliance. And uh, I, the society, the, the uh, humans, uh, or... Maybe even humans aren't the, the right word anymore. The, the evolved ver uh, variation of humans uh, known as belters. Um, and the way in which all three of these groups are at odds with each other. How Mars is in a state of uh, armistice against the Earth, where there was previously a war between Earth and Mars. How the belt is considered a um is is used 
in a lot of ways of uh, in a lot of senses of the word used by Mars and Earth for resources while being oppressed and subjugated and treated at subhuman levels and how this has effects on everyone. And the thing I think that is really truly fascinating about this is that it looks at the reality of things that when humans become multiplanetary especially with this being a series that is set so far in the future humans are intrinsically tribalistic beings as civilization grows and this is actually something that is stated in one of the most recent episodes in the fifth season that for civilization to happen you must have civil people. And if one goes, then so does the other. And with tribalism uh, as as an inherent nature of humanity, those tribes can become bigger and bigger as civilization and civility uh, also increases. But when one goes, so too does the other. And this is this is actually a story that is played out through all of the seasons of The Expanse and really shows the importance of when humans become multiplanetary also retaining their humanity in many senses of the word maintaining their uh, collaboration with each other their trust in each other um, dropping the the tribalistic sense that is so inherent to human nature and working with each other in ways that we can see today and for the past 20 years with the International Space Station, where those tribalistic natures uh, have been dropped, and we forget the, or maybe not forget, but we move past racism, move past nationalism, move past various isms, and work together regardless of the borders in which uh, people on board the International Space Station uh, come from, and instead work together as humans on a collective journey. So yeah, let's talk about The Expanse. Rich, what do you think? Better low than you to eat, kid. <laughs> Coming back to season one there, uh, from mem- my memory, uh, it plays a lot around uh, Erin, right? Who is the military advisor. And also Jules-Pierre Miao. Uh, sorry, Miao. <laughs> Jules-Pierre Mao, um, who is, I believe he owns that company that does the research on the proto molecule. Yes. If I remember rightly, uh, Protogen, I think. Right, yeah. So, um it revolves a lot around these two and this sort of cloak and dagger alliance that they have. And it just goes to show that if you put somebody in a position of national security who is inherently paranoid or has a paranoid personality, then what you're going to get is a, a very aggressive posture in your military. And if Aaron Wright had his way, they would have escalated that war with Mars years ago. You know, he's he's not a very trusting person at all, and very paranoid. Right, and it also talks about the uh, crew of the, originally the Martian gunship named the uh, Tachi, uh, which they subsequently renamed to the Rosinante, and the crew on it, uh, which includes uh, James Holden, Naomi Nagata, uh, Alex Kamal, and Amos Burton, who, uh, in effect, steal the ship, and it follows their story where they also are working both against and then later on with uh, a uh, police detective named Joe Miller, uh, who's a, a police detective from uh, series. Uh, who is investigating a uh, missing uh, young woman who is uh, Jules Pierre Mao's uh, daughter, Julie Mao. And actually all these characters play a huge role in the story uh, for the first season of, um, uh, of, of uh, The Expanse and demonstrating the odds at which these three groups, uh, Earthers, Martians, and Belters live uh, against each other, sometimes in uh, uh, cooperation with each other, but a lot of times in a uh, as as almost enemies. And one of the things I think that is really fascinating about this is that this this is 
you could you could say that science fiction often especially uh dystopian science fiction is a warning sign of what can come i uh, look at for example um george orwell's 1984 there was a lot of things in there about uh big brother i mean there are even a lot of um colloquialisms that have come from that uh the term big brother even i uh, i believe came from that novel uh to talk about an oppressive and i uh, a privacy disrespecting uh, government that doesn't trust any of its people, watches uh, everything that its people are doing, and uh, oppresses and controls its people. And, of course, there are a lot of things that we've seen uh, come true, unfortunately, out of 1984. And I think one of the things that's really important about The Expanse is that it shows what could happen if civility and civilization break down when humans become multiplanetary, and what we shouldn't do, what what's uh, what could occur if we are not careful about uh, being a multiplanetary species. One of the things we talked about in some previous episodes is, as humans become multiplanetary, if they settle on Mars, not just go there, do some uh, science, and then come back, but if they actually stay there, will they be an independent nation of a sort? Will they still be tied to the nations of Earth, or will they declare independence and become uh, something of their own, which is entirely possible, especially if they were to have uh, materials independence, not have to worry about getting uh, equipment and materials from Earth, that they could declare uh, independence and truly operate independently. But then, philosophically, what would that, what would that bring? What kind of a society... Uh, would that bring? What kind of a civilization would that bring? Would it be one that would work uh, in peace with Earth or against Earth in some form? And we see that, in fact, play out in the very first season, in fact, the very first episodes of uh, The Expanse. So if we fast forward the clock a minute for uh, season... Uh, let's Let's remove the season one restriction... Uh, you were talking about how the expanse was really good for a warning sign. And I think this is a really important point to touch on because it's great that we do have science fiction to use as almost like a, uh, a what if. You know, we can, we can hypothesize what ifs in our heads, but it's way better when you see it play out on a screen. Uh, you know, you've got science fiction, and they, they do this on the regular. They play out hypothetical scenarios from the future. And the, the, this is done very well in terms of political and philosophical uh, nature with the cautionary tale of Marco Inaros. So this is going to contain spoilers from season three so for those who haven't seen season three of the expanse yet i highly suggest that you tune out and quickly catch up on that because it is well worth the watch but effectively marco inaros is a belter and he he and his people have been oppressed for the majority of the first two seasons and they have been fighting throughout those two seasons to try and gain independence for the belt via a faction called the OPA, which Kage mentioned earlier. And effectively, Marco Inaros is a perfect example of what happens when you oppress a minority for an overly long period of time. Eventually, it's it's just gonna bite back. You know, you you know, it's it's just inevitably going to happen. But he's also a uh, warning sign, as we've seen in the past several years, of what happens when a demagogue um, abuses that uh, oppression and actually turns it into a form of oppression of their own. That rather than use the, rather than leverage the pain of their people to uh, fight for peace. Uh, he leverages the pain of uh, his people to fight war and to kill millions of innocent uh, innocent people on Earth and on Mars uh, to, in effect, send a message of uh, dominance and power. 
and he also uh, declares that he wants to uh, take over the uh, the ring that uh, gain that gives access to the other worlds. This is a little bit of a spoiler for um, uh, season three and four, but uh, he demands to and season five. Uh, he demands to take over the ring and have it be something that is purely under the belt's control. So basically, uh, the oppressed now want to be the oppressor, and that's the danger of when you have oppressed people and a demagogue, or, or maybe even not an oppressed people, but just a uh, a, a people who have been um, unable to live life to their fullest and have had pain and subjugation and other uh, challenges in their life, that when you have a demagogue step up, um, it can really it can really uh, send things into a dangerous spiral. But see, this is why Marco Inaros is written so well as a character, right? He's naturally a charismatic person, so he's got that going for him. But at the same time, regardless of the means he uses to get there, what his endgame is, a lot of belters want. It's a very enticing uh, you know, thought of having belter superiority. When you have a people who have been oppressed that long, to then be a, to have someone turn around and tell them, well, what if we could be the oppressors? Right. Yes. So, since we're now getting into uh, season five a little bit, uh, maybe let's shift uh, gears into that. <clears throat> Sorry, one second. So, in the fifth season of the Expanse, there's an important plot point that is unearthed, pun intended, and that is that the inhabitants of the solar system are wholly dependent on the Earth for biological resources, including fertile soil and many other things. And while technologies like CRISPR and 3D bioprinting, which we'll talk about in just a little bit, don't exactly seem to exist or really aren't mentioned so much in the Expanse universe, this plot point demonstrates the importance of these technologies as humanity comes ever closer to becoming multiplanetary. Not because of the oppression that exclusive control of these materials can bring, although that is very important to note, as we've been talking about, but because of a different kind of tyranny, and that is the tyranny of the rocket equation and having the necessary materials on hand when so far away from Earth. The tyranny of the rocket equation is that in order to get a payload into space, you need fuel and oxidizer, which adds weight. So, to push this weight, you need fuel and oxidizer, which adds weight. And you can kind of see where this is going. So, let's get a little bit scientific here. Using the rocket equation of e to the power of delta v uh, divided by uh, v of e, where e is approximately 2.72, to the power of delta v, which is how far a rocket can go considering its propellant mass and efficiency, uh, divided by the exhaust velocity, which is uh, essentially the energy available from a particular type of propulsion, we can derive the thrust to payload ratio. So let's take, for example, the venerable Saturn V rocket. Only 4% of its overall weight was payload, even less still with a space shuttle at only about 1%. So using the Vis Viva uh, orbital energy invariance equation, we can find that low Earth orbit about 250 kilometers above sea level requires approximately 9.3 kilometers per second of delta V plus an additional 10.4 kilometers per second delta V to get to the surface of Mars. So as a rough example in using uh, Tsiolkovsky's uh, equation and several assumptions here, to get, let's say, 26,000 kilograms of materials to Mars, we would need almost 27 times the amount of that weight in terms of fuel, nearly 700,000 kilograms. So this shows exactly why it is critical to be able to manufacture everything and anything we can in space if we ever hope to make it away from the safety of Earth for any extended period of time. And that includes not only metallurgic and plastic materials, but especially even biological materials. So let's talk about that for a second. So, what do we mean about biological materials? Well, let's take, for example, diseases and illnesses. There's kind of a, 
little thing going on around uh, for the past year or so. Um, some small human malware uh, event thing. Uh, <laughs> not my term, by the way. I have to give credit to Gamers Nexus for coining that term. I, I love it. Uh, human malware. It's amazing. But let's take, for example, the uh, COVID-19 vaccination. So if humans are traveling for a long period of time uh, away from Earth, that they're not going to be able to get any sort of, uh, sort of vaccine. What happens if there is a virus that evolves in uh, space, in human bodies, that ends up uh, having detrimental effects on those humans in a way maybe even similar to uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is the virus that causes COVID-19? Well, that's where you would need to have technology in that space uh, vehicle with those astronauts in order to make sure that they're able to hopefully manufacture something in order to combat it. Uh, be that a uh, vehicle traveling through space or on a space station or on the surface of Mars, it would be necessary to have that material available and the engineering uh, uh, available to create a vaccine. Let's take, for example, uh, the COVID-19 vaccination. So there are four main kinds of uh, COVID-19 vaccines uh, currently. There's uh, mRNA, vector, protein subunit, and inactivated virus. For now, we'll only talk about mRNA, uh, which is used by Pfizer and Moderna. So MR mRNA vaccines work by taking the genetic sequence of a virus and extracting the messenger ribonucleic acid sequence that creates proteins. In this case, the protein that creates the corona of the SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus. When a body is injected with this compound, the immune system goes into overdrive because it detects a foreign protein and begins attacking it, and importantly, remembering that protein that it attacked so that it can do so again later and more efficiently. And this is what creates local immunity in the host body. Then, if that same body contracts the SARS-CoV-2 virus, viral load, or the amount of virus in the body, won't be able to occur and the body can quickly attack and kill the virus before it has much chance to do uh, anything further, uh, such as create a uh, more widespread infection. But in order to do this, however, it requires genetic sequencing and engineering. And one such approach is CRISPR. All right, class, buckle up. It's about to get biological in here. <laughs> so, CRISPR been doing a lot of research on this topic. Uh, so it's an acronym that stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. And what this means is basically parts of your DNA that repeat in a certain pattern. Um, and you'll also, when you see the term CRISPR used, you'll normally see it with a slash Cas9. And what the Cas9 means is CRISPR Associated Protein 9. And this is a specifically created protein that uses uh, the CRISPR method. And it comes in at 160 kilodaltons, which means that the Cas9 protein molecule weighs about 2.656862.3 to the 10 power negative 13 micrograms. And CRISPR is actually one of three methods of genetic editing, uh, the other two being zinc finger nucleases, ZFNs, and uh, talons, which is transcription activator-like effector nucleases. However, the since the CRISPR method, uh, CRISPR-Cas9 method has been found, it is now considered to be the most cost-effective, efficient, and easy to use. Um, we know this because we've actually seen, at the, well, I've personally seen documentaries on people who do experimental gene editing as a hobbyist thing, which is, that's, that's a, a thing to be debated, but, uh, regardless. It's one hell of a hobby, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is one hell of a hobby. Um, but you know, as, as reckless as it might seem at the end of the day, it's probably people like this that will eventually find some really important breakthrough in genetic and, um, genetic research. Yeah, they they're probably going to be the first ones to find things because they're they're out there, trying, they're on the front, you know, the frontier. They're the pioneers, as it were. And we know that when you're the pioneer of something, how how dangerous it can be. So I'm pretty sure that 
they understand the the consequences, but um, they they you know they want to be out there doing that research. CRISPR. We said in the title of the episode we were going to get a quick look into it, and that's what we're going to do. So, how does it work? So, your average mo- uh, molecular CRISPR will have something called gRNA, which is guide ribonucleic acid. So, this is a template genetic sequence that tells the CRISPR molecule what genetic sequence to target. So it will basically just travel through your DNA until it finds this particular sequence, and it will do what is called a DSB, which is a double-strand break at the targeted location, and then it will perform either a KI or a KO, which is a knock-in or knock-out on the interrupted sequence. So a knockout attempts to either delete part of the DNA sequence or insert junk DNA sequence information to disrupt the expression of a specific genetic locus at that point. I'll get a bit more into what that means later on. I know that sounds quite heavy there, but it'll make sense in a moment. And a knock-in operation, on the other hand, attempts to alter that genetic area of interest via a one-for-one substitution of DNA sequence information so that's like you've got a specific DNA expression you want to write. It's literally overwriting the, the genes one by one. Or by the addition of sequence information that is not found on said genetic locus. So boiling all that down, in very basic terms, a knock-in will increase the likelihood of a function mutation within that target sequence that something new happens or a, a new function will develop. Whereas a knockout will cause a loss of mutation function within the target sequence. Now this is especially important because when you knock out a mutation from a target sequence, things like that can be used to knock out mutations that trigger genetic diseases, for example. Um, or perhaps knock out genetic variants that develop cancer cells. So this is very, very important. And not only with uh, CRISPR, but there are also other things that come into play when uh, we're talking about uh, biological engineering, uh, such as, for example, uh, 3D bioprinting. And right now, in fact, the International Space Station is conducting experiments using 3D bioprinting. There are three main 3D bioprinting technologies, uh, including extrusion, inkjet, and laser-based bio, uh, bioprinting. and they do have some common limitations, such as uh, having slow speed, uh, inability to create 3D constructs uh, with complex geometry, and especially the complications that come into uh, doing bioprinting when you have gravity to contest with. So there are new approaches, uh, such as acoustic or magnetic bioprinting, that uh, have been used, but now, uh, especially in microgravity of the inter- of the International Space Station, uh, they have that as a cofactor of uh, 3D bioprinting. So that means that they can use scaffold-free, nozzle-free, and label-free bioprinting, which means that they don't need uh, to use, for example, uh, magnetic nanoparticles uh, to uh, follow approach follow an approach called formative biofabrication, uh, which instead of doing uh, bottom-up additive manufacturing, they can do uh, a more truly 3D bioprinting from, let's say, the inside out. Uh, for example, to create an artificial human heart or other sort of uh, materials that might be needed. And so this is really important because, especially when humans would be so far away from Earth, what would happen, for example, if there is an entire society established on Mars where, let's say, you have hundreds of people and out of those hundreds of people, eventually somebody is going to have some sort of genetic de- uh, predisposition for something that is going to come up. For example, somebody might end up having a uh, might end up having liver failure for some genetic reason. And here on Earth, there are other humans in which you can uh, have liver uh, donations from, either from a uh, partial liver donation from a living uh, person or especially a uh, full liver donation from somebody who has been recently pronounced deceased. But you only have that because we have over 7 billion people on Earth 
Whereas if you only have a few hundred on Mars, you don't have that opportunity. Not so much. So this is where uh, 3D bioprinting really becomes an, uh, a, a critical asset. Not only uh, 3D bioprinting, but also coupled with CRISPR so that we can do the necessary genetic engineering and manufacturing to make sure that humanity can not only become a multiplanetary species, but can stay uh, a multiplanetary species. So, what does all this have to do with the expanse? <laughs> so, what is the protomolecule? The way that it's described on the expanse, uh, one of the scientists on one of the episodes, I can't recall which one, but they get, they go to a protogen lab, they find one of the scientists, and he describes the protomolecule as a set of free-floating instructions designed to adapt to and guide other replicating systems. So, effectively, what this means is it's an inert molecule that when it finds a replicating system, be it silicon-based or carbon-based, it will become active and it will manipulate that replication system over time. And at the beginning of the show, the purpose of this is unknown, but over the five seasons it, it becomes quite clear what it ends up being. So, to go a bit more into the protomolecule, this is what I was able to find. By the way, Sources that we've used over this episode will be linked in the episode description if you guys want to have a look at this stuff yourself. It's really fascinating. But coming back to the protomolecule, <clears throat> it is able to maintain and adapt its primary structure in a wide variety of conditions, and it has an affinity for carbon and silicon structures, as I mentioned earlier, but is likely anaerobic and will not degrade upon exposure to oxygen. Uh, ionizing radiation seems to accelerate the protomolecule's growth significantly, which, having thought about this and having had a conversation with Framrick prior to the start of the, the show uh, about ionizing radiation, um, he mentions that it, it can damage DNA with free radicals. And I think the reason that this means the protomolecule is managing to infect the host easier is because these free radicals are damaging that host's DNA into smaller chunks, which effectively makes it easier for the protomolecule to rearrange. I think that's why, because it, cause it doesn't make sense for it to be damaging the protomolecule's DNA, you know, it, it doesn't make sense for it to work that way. So I, f I feel like it should be because the DNA is in smaller chunks and, and the, the protomolecule is able to adapt that quicker. What do you think, Kage? I'm not sure. <laughs> I mean, um, so so now we're getting into a, a bit more of the uh, really sci-fi aspect of it. Of uh, how how would the how would the proto molecule react? And I think that's more of a question for the writers. But um, it really it really though demonstrates that um, there are a lot of interesting unknowns, but also parallels. Uh, with the writing of the protomolecule. For example, the way that the protomolecule works is not so very dissimilar to viruses here on Earth. Um, I mean, it's it's obviously something that is highly uh, different in a lot of ways, uh, even has some um, intelligence that is passed down through its own genetics, which is not that uh, scientifically improbable. In fact, that does even happen uh, where, for example, um, hunting instincts that exist within uh, various animals, that is something that is often a genetically encoded thing uh, rather than something that is uh, taught to them from their parents. You can see this, for example, where uh, animals that are bred, or animals that uh, grow up in the wild or take even, for example, domesticated dogs, there are certain dogs that even if you raise them a certain way, they still have that genetic, genetically inherent uh, drive to do certain things. Uh, herding breeds have a lot of energy and just need to get rid of that energy in certain particular ways. 
uh, similar to herding. Even though they may never have done herding at all in their life, they still somehow know it. And that is actually something that is demonstrated uh, both here on Earth as well as in the um, sci-fi aspect of the protomolecule that there's this genetic intelligence. So uh, there's some really interesting uh, parallels there to uh, a lot of things here on Earth when it comes to um, what could be and what would be, uh, what, or, or rather what is and what could be. Yeah. And talking about parallels between the protomolecule and CRISPR, if we come back to that, from what I've said so far, there's a there's a few parallels already, but the, the main one I see is the protomolecule was designed by an extraterrestrial uh, species uh, about two billion years in the past, and they effectively launched it on trajectories that they aimed at planetary systems they guessed that would be the most likely systems to harbor or develop some kind of emergent molecular replication system. So they just, basically, they were all moonshots, and that they send them out. And the one that was bound for the Sol system ended up getting caught in Saturn's gravity well and settled there as a satellite. So the parallel to CRISPR is... When we see when a human host becomes infected with a protomolecule, it changes the the DNA structure. You know, the, the protomolecule seems to just rearrange things. Uh, Miller actually paraphrases this, I believe, during one of those scenes where Miller's a hallucination for Holden. And he's like, you know, just moving things around and flipping switches. And you know, he talks about flipping switches a lot. Um, and and that's that is effectively the protomolecule just going around flipping switches in people's DNA, trying to look for certain things, you know. And with CRISPR, that is effectively what you're doing. You're you're either deleting sections of DNA or you're overwriting sections of DNA via the knock-in and knock-out procedures. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So, where does this take us from here? Well. There's a lot of really interesting information that we've uh, talked about in this episode. Um, first and foremost, watch The Expanse if you haven't already. It's an amazing series. You will not regret it. I highly recommend it. Um, but also, when watching The Expanse, or especially even re-watching The Expanse with these things in mind, think about this, about what would be needed for humanity to really become a multiplanetary species. First, philosophically, we need to be able to work together in ways that we've already seen that we can do on the International Space Station. Drop those barriers of racism, drop those barriers of nationalism, and work together as one species, as one group, as one entity to better humanity overall. Secondly, in order to stay a multiplanetary species and not be locked to Earth, but actually be able to survive and thrive on other planetary bodies, we need to be able to manufacture things in space or on other planetary bodies. Not just fuel, uh, like for example uh, methane and oxygen, as uh, SpaceX, for example, has been researching, but also other things. Uh, uh, metals, plastics, and especially and most importantly, biological materials. If we are to withstand the kind of fragility of human uh, life when it comes to living in space and on uh, planetary bodies, we need to be able to survive things like viruses, like pandemics because those will inevitably happen with the more people that you have in space in close quarters to each other. If you take, for example, the International Space Station, the starship that is currently being developed by SpaceX, when it's completed, will actually have a bit more interior space than the entirety of the International Space Station. If you think about that for a minute, the space station, when spread out, is larger than an American football field. 
uh, almost as big as a European football field, maybe maybe about the same size, if not larger. But the interior space inside the space station is really small. It's not that many uh, cubic centimeters, or cubic meters, I guess, would be a better measure there. So when you have a lot of people in close quarters, as you would have to, uh, for example, in a, a different kind of space station, or on the surface of Mars, eventually something's going to happen where somebody gets sick, and they're going to need to be treated for that. If you don't have the materials to treat them for that on that space station, on that uh, outpost on Mars, or especially uh, on the moon, or especially on Mars, then you need to be able to develop something, because the longer that somebody is infected in that close of quarters to dozens or hundreds of other people, the more probable it is that others may also catch that infection and could end up dying. So we really need to study the expanse, for example, from a couple different angles, the philosophical implications as well as the biological implications. What will happen to human bodies when they are on another uh, planetary body. And actually, we even see that in the expanse. For example, uh, Martian marines train in uh, Earth gravity, or simulated Earth gravity, in case they need to land on Earth and take the war to Earth. Um, but um, Bobby Draper, one of the uh, uh, main characters in the series, actually she has to take uh, some... Uh, some medications while she's on Earth for an extended period of time in order to withstand Earth's gravity. There's another scene where a belter is being tortured just using gravity alone because they've grown up on microgravity environments where they just they can't really survive on Earth because it's, it's crushing for them. And so we really need to think about um, those implications, those biological implications that we have with becoming a multiplanetary species. Yeah. 100% with you on that one, for sure. And the, it, as a show, it has so much to offer from all of these different viewpoints. However, uh, at this point, Kage, would you like to think about opening some questions to the listeners? Absolutely. So, this has been uh, a very scientific episode, which uh, is actually a lot of fun. I, uh, I really enjoyed uh, putting this together with you, Rich. Um, so... Yeah, if anybody uh, has any questions, then feel free to submit them. And by the way, for those listening, if you would like to also be able to submit questions to us, uh, you can join us on our Discord by becoming a patron on Patreon. So if you go to patreon.com slash total space, uh, there are various uh, patron tiers, which um, any one of them will grant you access to our Discord. And then you can uh, join the rest of our patrons uh, who listen when we record these episodes. For example, right now we're recording this on Friday, uh, when uh, this will be released uh, later on. Uh, you can join us uh, on Fridays when we record uh, Becoming Multiplanetary, and uh, yeah, and uh, listen to us and ask us whatever you like. So we do have a question from Framerick, who has been a uh, recurring guest on this show and a couple of others which is that he says, I have a comment uh, slash question, but it's more confirming the ability of TV shows or authors to, quote, guess the future. Is this okay? I think it's not only okay, but it's also important. Because if we don't ask these kind of questions, then if and when we get to those sort of situations... We are left without answers and left to try and figure out in the moment what we should do. And if you think uh, to, you know, why does anyone rehearse anything? Why do militaries do drills? Why do musicians uh, practice music? It's important to have that practice to know what to do when a situation occurs. So that way, instead of panicking, they approach that situation with calmness with candor, with uh, a, a well-reasoned thought, and they know how to handle it uh, without making mistakes and panicking. And so when you have a TV series like The Expanse asking questions uh, like it asks, even though it doesn't really ask questions, it does. 
it's important to do that because then we can really think about, well, wow, this is a good demonstration of what could happen if we aren't civil to each other. If civilization breaks down when we become multiplanetary, here's what we shouldn't do. If you think back to uh, 1984, again, the book, uh, not the year, it really gave some good demonstrations about what could happen if civility and civilization breaks down, if governments disrespect privacy, uh, if they become intrusive and controlling of people. And for a long time, it actually made for a good analog of this is what could be if we aren't careful. And people used it to point to and say, this is this is the wrong thing. This is this is the worst outcome that could happen. This is what we shouldn't do. Here's a demonstration of that. Yeah, and th these analogs in sci-fi are very, very important to you know, because a lot of people watch them just from you know your ordinary Joe blogs will always watch a, a, a sci-fi show, and being able to convey that message or convey the the analog of you know this is what could happen if if we're not nice to each other or this is what could happen if you know, people had uh, not so scrupulous motives, perhaps. Uh, you know, in, in the higher up, and and these are good questions. You know, these are these are good hypotheticals. Right, exactly. And actually, as Framick also pointed out, there are some good things that were predicted uh, by a lot of these uh, sci-fi shows. Uh, Arthur C. Clarke, uh, geostationary communication satellites, Star Trek. I, uh, I. Uh, showed uh, the original series um, showed flip out communicators cell phones the expanse spreading out of the human species across the solar system and the different impacts that that carries uh, Star Trek 4 transparent aluminum which oh yeah by the way we have transparent aluminum now <laughs> meta materials boggle the mind to me like it's like how how are you able to do this it's almost like sorcery or alchemy or something yeah, I'm I'm absolutely fascinated by that. When I when I read that, I was blown away. I was like, "There's there's no way." Like, okay, maybe they they figured out a uh, small nanomaterial, like similar to like carbon nanotubes that they could make in a very very controlled environment, and it only lasted for a short amount of period, and it was brittle and all that sort of stuff. And they're like, "Nope, we made the whole thing. We can just you know protect banks with this stuff now. It's cool." It's like, what? <laughs> yeah, it's literally crazy what comes out of innovation and progress and technology. Another space nut who is a uh, common uh, co-host on many of the uh, Total Space Network podcasts uh, also said it's uh, worth mentioning that Tesla has started making RNA printers and uh, Elon recently tweeted saying that it's the key to our DNA uh, that uh, we can work wonders with it. Uh, we'll also put a link to that in the description for this show. Um, so, yeah, uh, excellent point there. Uh, well, this was a heck of a packed episode, that's for sure. Science galore, sci-fi galore, a lot to unpack and, and go look at as well. We're going to have plenty of sources for you in the episode description. Thank you all for joining us again for Becoming Multiplanetary, the first episode of 2021. Uh, we're going to have a lot more science and space coming up throughout the year, so definitely keep your ears peeled or your eyes peeled if we decide to do any video specials. And um, as always, I just want to say a big thank you to all of our Patreons. I'm going to reel them off here like I do every episode. Uh, we've got Howard Walker, we've got Sammy Oscuro, we've got What About It, we've got Jishwana Sebastian, we've got Gio Pagliari, we've got Framrick, who's been here with us, uh, we've got Susie, who's also been here with us, listening in, and we've got Marco, who's also been here with us, listening in. So, yeah, honestly, guys, thank you so much. Uh, you you know, we're, we're honored that you're backing us through this and that you're helping us, you know, we're we're starting to use the Patreon funds now to actually fund better systems for Total Space, and there's going to be a lot of good changes coming for 2021. And uh, one last thing uh, before I pass over to Cargo to wrap up. Belt a load, Agonia need to eat, okay? <laughs> Very nice. Yes, so I uh, thank you all again for joining us. I am Kage, one of the co-hosts of Becoming Multiplanetary. 
as Rich mentioned, um, we are in fact using the generous uh, Patreon donations uh, to improve the show for you. Uh, one of those things that we are doing is actually working on the Total Space website where we will be posting all of our content from now on in the near future here. And um, it's it's uh, really going to be uh, awesome, uh, everything that we've been uh, putting together for you. Um, so yeah, if you're uh, interested in that, you can always uh, check us out on totalspace.net. Uh, that's currently a landing page, but will soon be a, um, uh, a really well-fleshed-out uh, website for all of our content. But you can also catch us on all the various uh, social media platforms. Uh, for example, on YouTube, uh, Total Space is our uh, channel there. On Twitter, uh, at Total Space Net. You can also catch us on Instagram at Total Space Network. So, uh, with that, um, thank you again so much for joining us. If you like these more kind of scientifically oriented uh, episodes, definitely let us know in the comments. Uh, shoot us a message on Twitter, on Instagram. Uh, you can uh, also email us, uh, uh, staff at totalspace.net, and let us know what you think. And if you really like the content, uh, definitely think about becoming a Patreon. So go to uh, patreon.com slash total space, and you can uh, join us on our Discord. We love the feedback that we hear from all of you about our content. It really helps us to grow and make uh, content that uh, you enjoy and that we enjoy producing for you. And with that, let's get 2021 off to a great start and looking forward to uh, making more episodes for you. See you all next week, folks.